Okay. Um, so <clears throat> with this section, we're going to look at some optimization or, well, extreme values of multivariate functions. So um, this is very similar to finding local maximum and local minimum of single variable functions from Calc 1. But we're doing them now with Calc in Calc 3 with multiple variables. Okay, so just the definition here. What do we mean by local maximum or local minimum? So we call the function at a, b a local max of f if for which f at a, b is greater than or equal to f of x, y for all x comma y in the range of f of x, y. And we call f of a, b a local min of f if for which the only difference is this instead of the function being greater than all the rest of the values on the function it's going to be less than all the values of the function because it's a local minimum for all x, y in the range of f of x, y. So those are left, you know, rough definitions of local max and local minimum of multivariate functions. And I just want to put this little side note here. For either case, f at a comma b is a local extremum in either case. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> how do we know that, you know, so if you remember from Calc 1, how do we find local max and local mins? We apply the first derivative test, right? Well, before that, we have to identify a critical value, right? So that should be pretty familiar to you. To find a critical value, we take the derivative and set it equal to zero. But since we're dealing with multivariate functions, now we're taking two first derivatives and setting them equal to zero because we have two variables. Or in some cases, we have three variables, so we take three derivatives. In other words, we take the first order derivatives of each variable in the function. So, no. The point a comma b is a critical point of the function f of x comma y if a comma b is in the domain of f of x y and either the two are true and this is very similar from calc 1 the partial derivative of f with respect to x at a, b, which is equal to the partial derivative of f with respect to y 
at AB, where the both first partial derivatives are equal to zero, or one of the derivative of f with respect to x or derivative of f with respect to y fail to exist. Now, in other words, either a point here may not exist, a point here may not exist, or both of them. Um, either one or both of them could happen. So I'll just make a little side note here. either one or both. Um, so, you know, this is very similar to your definition of critical points in Calc 1. If you think about Calc 1, set the derivative equal to zero, solve for x, that's a critical point, and where f, f of x is undefined, that's also a critical point. This is where it's equal to zero, or where there are where, where the first partial derivatives, each variable, if either one of them fails to exist or both of them or whatever, any combination of the two, um, <clears throat> they're possible critical values. Um, so let's start off with a simple example here. Find all the critical points of f of x comma y equals 3x minus x cubed minus 3xy squared. <coughs> okay, um, so find the critical points. So take the partial derivatives. So the partial derivative of this with respect to x, so it's going to be 3 minus 3x squared minus 3y squared. Partial derivative with respect to y, that's a constant, that's a constant, so it's going to be 2 times negative 3, which is negative 6x, negative 6xy. Okay, so now set these so I want to find the two, uh, I want to find the ordered pairs x comma y, or, well yeah, x comma y, that, where they're both equal to zero. Now, if you notice, the domain, <clears throat> um, either one of these don't have values for x or y that are going to fail to exist because these are polynomial terms, so that's not going to show up here but this is the main one, just like in Calc 1. They rarely show up, but they have to be considered. All right, so you want to solve these equations for zero. All right, so what I'm going to have is, uh, let's look at this one first. So I'm going to have negative 6xy. I'm going to have that equal to zero. Okay, now why am I starting with this one? Well. If I look here, solving this equation for x or y, that's, you know, that's not going to be easy. Um, you know, I'm going to have, this is the equation of a circle, it looks like, so how can we solve this equation, right? Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to solve for these points here and see what I get from there and then use that one. Um, that's why I'm starting. This one's easier than this one. That's why I'm starting with that one. So if six, negative 6xy six is equal to 0, well... That means x equals 0 or y is equal to 0, right? Either one. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start with each case. So what if, if x is equal to 0? Well, so now I know that if x is equal to 0, I'm going to treat that, I'm going to put that one in here. 
right? So if I'm saying that x is equal to 0, based upon this, what's y going to be? So let's plug this in, because we're solving these two equations simultaneously now. We're, we're essentially doing this, right? We're solving this system simultaneously. So plug this into there. So when you do that, you get 3, well, when I plug 0 in there, I'm going to get 0. And then I'm going to have 3 minus 3y squared equals 0. Now solve this for y. So I'm going to have 3y squared equals 3, y squared equals 1, which means y equals plus or minus 1. Okay, so that's what I got if x was equal to 0. Now let's treat y equal to 0, because that's the other case. So if y is equal to 0, what am I going to get now? Well, let's plug that into here, the, the same equation. So that's going to make this 0, so I'm going to have 3 minus 3x squared equals 0. Right? And if I... So if I solve this for x, add 3x squared to both sides, so I'm going to get 3x squared equals 3, x squared equals 1, which means x is going to equal plus or minus 1. All right. So what are my critical points? Well, so these are the two cases for setting this equal to 0, and then when each case... I plug that into the other equation to find when that's going to be equal to zero, when this is zero. I'm solving this system simultaneously. So my critical points now remember your critical points have to be when they plug them in for x and y it must make both first derivatives equal to zero because that's the definition of a critical value. Or that's where, all, that's where critical points occur, when the first derivative is equal to 0. So when you plug in, so if I plug in 0, comma 0, right? So if I plug these two points in, x is 0 and y is 0, because that's what I got here. Well, if I plug them into the first derivatives, what do I get? Well, let's list all my possibilities. So I got 0 and 0 for x and y when I set this one equal to 0. So let's just list that down. We don't know if that's going to be a critical point. We're just listing out our possibilities. Now if x was 0, what do we get for y? We got plus and negative 1. So if x was 0, we got a positive 1 and a negative 1. All right. And when y was 0, x was either positive 1 or negative 1. So when x was positive 1, when we had 0 for y, and it was negative 1 when we had 0 for y. So these are all, so all five of these are my possible critical points. Now we have to make sure if they are actual critical points. Now when I plug 0, 0 into these first derivatives, do I get 0 in both of them? Actually, I don't. If I plug 0, 0 into here, yes, I get 0 because we solved that equation. But if I plug 0, 0 in here, what do I get? Well, this term and this term go away, but I have 3. So this is not a critical point. And I'll just say here, since df dx equals 3 at that point. So that's not a critical point, because if you plug this in here, you're going to get 3. Now, you know, if you go through it and you plug 0 for x and 1, 1 for y into both of these first derivatives, you'll get 0 in both of them. You will see. So I'll just say here as a closing point, you know, if you could check that on your own, but if you plug these values into the first derivatives, you'll see that both the first derivatives will equal 0 at, at these four ordered pairs. So these are the critical points. And I'll just put a note here. Note, must make the partial with respect to x and the partial with respect to y
equal to zero. Okay, so you know you have to you have to be aware of that. Just because you get this doesn't mean it's a critical value. No, zero zero. Th those were two cases, but that does not make this a critical value because the first derivative with respect to x was three. So you got to watch out for that. All right, so you know. So, um, all right, so now that we know how to find critical values, well, let's talk about another interesting little thing that shows up. Before we actually start classifying these critical values into local maximum or local minimums, we have to talk about one other kind of point that could come up with these. And um, it's kind of similar to finding concavity with first, with um, with single variable functions. But um, instead of um, dealing with that, sometimes these points could be called a saddle point. Um, So what is a saddle point? So def uh, yeah, definition. A saddle point a comma b of the function z equals f of x, y is a critical point where A comma B is the following. So the function is greater than A comma B. And it's where the function is less than the point A comma B simultaneously. So it's either increasing or and decreasing at the same time. That's what a saddle point is. It you know it, it looks you know it's it's a hard concept where well it's not like a straightforward concept to visualize, but um, basically it's like the bottom of a valley or the top of a hill, and um, that's what saddle points represent. They, they represent like the peak of a horizon or the bottom of a valley of some sort of some surface in three, uh, two or three dimensions. Well, in three dimensions, but um, yeah. So that's what a saddle point kind of is. Um, so how do we classify... critical points of multivariate functions. How do we do this? Well, just like in Calc 1, there was a first derivative test. And it turns out there is another test in Calc 2, or I'm sorry, Calc 3, and we call the second derivative test. And I'll just say for multivariate functions. Um, you don't have to say that, but there is a second derivative test for multivariate functions. 
So here's what it says. Suppose my function has continuous second order partial derivatives in some domain containing the critical point a comma b and the partial of f with respect to x at a b equals the partial of y with respect to a b equals zero so they both simultaneously equal zero at those points and you know we're assuming that they're continuous second order partial derivatives um, you know, we're, in, as, in other words, we're at making sure these functions are nicely behaved. Um, if the functions were pretty sophisticated, then you could have run into some issues. But in this class, we're not going to really look at any complicated issues. Um, if you get into more advanced courses in mathematics, you will look at those kinds of things. But, um, you know, I wouldn't ask these questions if you couldn't compute this. Um, so, yeah. So we, we define what's called, now you may have heard this before in algebra, we, we define the discriminant capital D for the point A comma B by the following. You may have heard of this term before. Um, if you remember back to, you know, this is a long time ago for some of you, the quadratic formula. Remember that term underneath the radical symbol in the quadratic formula? Like, let me just jot it down here. Negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. That was the quadratic formula. Remember, this term under here was called the discriminant. Um, it's kind of similar to the structure that we're going to look at here, but it involves the uh, partial derivatives of a uh, multivariate function. Um, so this dis I just want you to know that this discriminant and this discriminant are two separate types of things. They're not related in any way. Um, so how do we define the discriminant? Well, we call it the uh, it's d evaluated at the critical point, and it's equal to the partial with respect to x with respect to x. So this is the second partial derivative. We take the derivative with respect to x twice. We start from the inside and work our way out at the point a b times the second order partial derivative with respect to y at a b minus bracket the partial with respect to x then with respect to y at a comma b that value squared so it kind of looks you know something like b squared minus 4ac but there's no 4 in here but um, that right there's the discriminant for the second derivative test and we compute this value for each critical value on the function and the following are true. If the discriminant at the critical value is positive and the original or the second derivative at the critical value is also positive, then f of x, y has a local minimum. at AB. If the discriminant is positive and 
and the second order partial with respect to x at a, b is negative, then the function has a local max at a comma b. Third, if the discriminant is negative, then we already can make a conclusion. If we have a negative discriminant, then f of x comma y has a saddle point at a, b. And the last condition, if the discriminant at a comma b happens to be zero, then no conclusion can be made. Um, so that right there is the second derivative test for multivariate functions. Find your critical points, compute your, so you're, you know, you, you take the first derivative, the second derivative, up here when you're finding critical values, then you're going to take the derivatives of those two functions with respect to x again, with respect to y again, and then you're going to take the partial of that with respect to y. Test your critical values, each one of them, and look at the value of the discriminant for each one, and then make your conclusion. Um, you know, how do we get this value? Um, well, it actually comes from the determinant you know, I'll just make a note of it here. It's an interesting note, but if you take the determinant between the partial with respect to the double partial with respect to x, pick the partial of x with respect to y, make the next partial of x with respect to y, and then take the partial of y with respect to y. So if you take the determinant here, so how do you take the determinant again? This times this minus this times this, you actually end up getting this formula. Um, because, you know, if you, do, if you do this times this, or I'm sorry, if you do this times this, there it is right there, minus this times this, ends up being the mixed partial squared. Because if you remember when we did partial derivatives, the partial of xy is the same thing as the partial of y, x. You know, they're essentially the same thing. So you end up getting a term squared there. So, you know, just an interesting way of looking at it. But this is actually called, you don't need to know this, but it's just an interesting note anyway. This is called the Hessian of f of x, y. That's called the Hessian. Um, if you go on to differential equations, that'll be called the uh, Ronskian. And we're actually going to see it not too uh, in when we do integration. We're gonna, it's going to be called the Jacobian. Um, but anyway, let's look at an example. Let's look at an example here. Um, I'm going to literally take one right out of the um, textbook here. Let's see if I can find a good one here. Uh,
just bear with me I'm looking for a I'm looking for a decent one here um, So let's locate and classify the critical points of C equals x squared times y minus 4xy plus 1 third y cubed minus 3 half y squared. So find the critical points and then classify them as local maximum, local minimums, or saddle points. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> so, all right. So when you do this, you're using the second derivative test for multivariate functions. So, start taking your partial derivatives, man. So, all right. Partial of z with respect to x, and then we're going to take the partial of z with respect to y. So when you take the partial of this, so you know you got to be good at these things by now, but. So that's going to be 2xy minus 4y. That's a constant. That's a constant. All right, so that's it for the partial with respect to x. Now the y. So I'm going to have x squared minus, so derivative of y is 1. So I'm going to have a minus 4x. That's a con oh no, that's not a constant. Sorry, that's going to be so power rule. So you're going to threes cancel out. So it's going to be plus y squared. And bring the y out. So two is going to cancel. That's going to be minus three y. All right. So now you could, you know, since we're going to classify them and we're using the second derivative test, you might as well, you know, compute the second order derivatives now. You could do that over here, or you could save that for later. I'm going to do them now just to get them out of the way, but that's fine. So, if I want to take the derivative of this with respect to x, so that's going to be, right, you know, if I use the uh, subnotation for partials, which might be more convenient, this is z sub x, this is z sub y, All right? So if I want to use that notation as opposed to the D notation, whatever way is fine. So that's the derivative of this with respect to x again. So that's going to be, so the derivative of x, that's going to be, so it's going to be 2y minus 4y, which is going to be what? Oh, wait, no, sorry, that, that's going to go away, all right? So the derivative of this is 2y, and the derivative has a constant, so the derivative that with this, so this is going to be 2y. Um, <clears throat> all right. Now I want to take the mixed partial. So that's z. That's with respect to x with respect to y. All right. So take the derivative of this now with respect to y. And again, you could you know you could do you know z with respect to x with respect to y is going to be equal to z. You know, if these two were flipped around, we learned that when we did partial derivatives. So if you take this one with respect to y or this one with respect to x, you should get the same result. Um, so z with respect to x, so take the derivative of this with respect to y. So you're gonna get you're gonna get two x and then you're gonna get minus four, right? If you take the derivative of this one with respect to x, you should get the same thing, two x minus four. 2x minus 4 constant constant when you do and then let's take the partial of y with respect to y so then take the partial of this with respect to y that's a constant that's a constant 
That's going to be 2y minus 3. Okay. So, you know, if you look back at the second derivative test, we just needed this, this, and this. And we got them. The double derivative of x, double derivative of y, and the mixed partial, x and y. Okay. So, you know, we'll save those for later. But, you know, we got the partial derivatives. Now, i got to find my critical values. So how do I do that? Well, I set these equal to zero. And then I solve them simultaneously. So when I do that, I get that's my first, that's the partial with respect to x. This is the partial with respect to y. So I gotta solve those two equations simultaneously. Okay, well, so I'm going to call this equation number one. I'm going to call this one equation number two. So I'm going to start with one first. Um, 2xy minus 4y equals zero. So if I factor, you know, a 2y out of here, and I get x minus, I get that, right? So I get 2y times x minus 4. Or I'm sorry, not x minus 4, x minus 2. So that'll give me that, and then minus 4y, yeah. So I could get, I could actually get rid of that 2 there. Just divide both sides by 2. So now I have this. Okay. So I have a product of two things equal to zero. So, you know, by algebra, that tells me that y equals zero or x minus two equals zero. Or in other words, x equals two. All right? Okay, so those are my two cases now. So let me start off with y equals 0. So if y equals 0, so we got that from doing from equation number 1, right? We got that from dealing with equation number 1. That's what this one was, and we got that. So now I'm going to take this, since this came from equation number one, I'm going to take that and plug it into equation number two. So when I do that, I'm going to get, so when y equals zero, I plug that in there, what do I get? So the y terms are going to go away, obviously. I'm going to have x squared minus 4x equals 0. All right? And if you factor that out, you're going to get x times x minus 4 equals 0, which means x equals 0, or x minus 4 equals 0, or in other words, x equals 4. So I get two values for x when y is equal to 0. So that leads me to two ordered pairs. That leads me to, so this one, right? This leads me to two cases right here. Just like this one led me to two cases. Um, so x is equal to zero when y is equal to zero. So that's that ordered pair. x is equal to four when y is equal to zero. So those right there are two, um, my order pairs for this particular case right here. Let me label this just so we can keep track of all the cases. Let me label this as the smiley face case. This one is the star case. So we worked on smiley face right now, right? Now we're going to work on star. 
because we've exhausted all the possible cases. We didn't get any more possibilities from these from solving this equation. So these two are my, you know, they're my cases from the smiley face case. Now let's work on star. What did star say? If x was equal to 2. All right, and then we're going to plug that into, where did that come from? That value came from equation number 1. So we're going to take that and plug it into equation 2. And when we do that, what do we get? So if I plug that into equation 2, all right, if x equals 2, so that's not going to make terms go away, unfortunately. But So x squared minus 4x plus y squared. Minus 3y equals 0. When you plug in x equals 2 there, what do we get? We get 4 minus 4. Well, that actually does work out. Um, oh, wait, no. Yeah. So 2 squared is 4 minus 4 times 2. That's going to be negative 8. So I'm going to have 4 minus 8, which is negative 4 plus y squared minus 3y equals 0. But, you know, if we rearrange these terms here, um, you can see that this is a quadratic equation in terms of y. So how do you solve a quadratic equation? Well, you could factor it. Hopefully it factors. y and y, 1 and 4. So that's going to be negative 4 and positive 1. All right? So that means y plus 1 equals 0, or y minus 4 equals 0, which means y equals negative 1, or y equals 4. All right. So by plugging 2 into equation 2, those are the values I got for y. So if x is 2, I got negative 1 for y. And if x is 2 again, I got 4 for y as well. So I've exhausted both of the cases when I solved equation number 1 and I plugged into equation number 2 and I got two other cases for each value from case 1. So I went through all my possible cases so these are my potential critical values. Now if you plug these into these two equations, you must get zero. And with, you know, and if you do check that out, they actually do, they end up holding. So each one of these are my critical values. So my critical points. are 0, 0, 4, 0, 2, negative 1, and 2, 4. Now i got to classify them. Now I've got to classify them. So classifying these critical points, um, you know, it just depends on how, you know, it's pretty straightforward, but you just got to compute the, uh, the discriminant. So let me put that down here for reference for each partial derivative. So that's that times that minus the quantity so we've got to classify with that. Alright, so you just got to go through each one with this formula and see if it applies to one of these four conditions. And by the way, if we do get condition four, since no conclusion can be made, maybe I should have said this, but I'll say it now, um, you'll have to find another way to classify the critical point AB. What do I mean by another way? Well, you know, we're in Calc 3 right now, so sometimes, you know, you know, you might have to resort to using uh, a math, you know, 
computer software program to do it. I mean, you're getting to the point now where methods by hand are limited at what you can do because, you know, we're getting more sophisticated. Okay, so at the point 0, 0, right? So here's my first. So now I'm using my second order partials at that point. Alright, so let me copy these down here just so we have them for the case of the example. Alright, so this is the partial of the function with respect to x twice, partial with respect to y twice, partial with respect to x, then respect to y. So these are my second order partial derivatives. Now the discriminant says I want to find, so this means I'm computing z at 0, 0 times z partial y, 0, 0 minus z partial xy at 0, 0 squared. And I want to see what that gives me. So if I plug 0, 0 into the second partial derivative. So if I plug in 0, 0 here, what am I going to get? Well, I'm going to get 0, right? So I'm going to get 0 times, so when I plug in 0, 0 into this one, I'm going to get, well, there's only y in here, so I'm going to have 2 times 0 minus 3. That's going to be negative 3 minus the mixed partial squared at 0, 0. So this is the mixed partial. So if I plug 0, 0 in there, I get 2 times 0 minus 4, which is negative 4. Right. And that's going to be squared. So when I go through that, so I have 0 times negative 3, which is 0, minus negative 4 squared is positive 16. All right. So I have minus, so I have 0 minus 16, which makes the discriminant negative 16. So since the discriminant is negative here, what's my conclusion? Um, well, this means the discriminant is negative, right? That's what this is. This is the discriminant. So, <clears throat> so if I look at my conclusion, right, if the discriminant is negative, then that means what? It's a saddle point. So that means the point zero, zero is a saddle point. Alright, now you just do that process again three more times for each one. So, let's see if I could speed this up a little bit. As you can see, it's really not hard, but it's just tedious. So, alright. Once you get the feel for doing the discriminant computation, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty quick. So, what's my first, instead of writing this out again, I'm just going to write out the values because I have it right here. Um... So at 4, 0, what do I get? So this at 4, 0, right? Not 0, 0 this time, at 4, 0. So this at 4, 0 is going to be what? That's going to be 0, right? Because it'll be 2 times 0 times this at 4, 0. So four comes. So it'll also be zero, right? Or oh, wait, no, that'll be negative three. My bad. I was looking at this one. Um, so z y y at four is zero. That'll be two times zero minus three, which be negative three. Then minus the quantity of this one at four zero. So at four zero there, that'll be what? That's 2 times 4, which is 8. 8 minus 4 is 4. So that'll be 0 minus 4 squared, which is 16, which is also 
negative 16, which means the discriminant is negative, which means 4 comma 0 is also a saddle point. All right. 2 negative 1. So 2 negative 1 at the first one. So that's going to be 2 times negative 1, which is negative 2, times, so zyy. So that's going to be 2 times negative 1 minus 3. So 2 times negative 1 is negative 2. Negative 2 minus 3 is negative 6. All right, did I do that right? Or is that negative 5? Yeah, no, I'm doing multiplication. It should be negative 5, all right? Yeah, my bad. Um, Oh boy, so yeah, 2 times negative 1 is negative 2, negative 2 minus 3 is negative 5. I'm going crazy. Um, and then z of xy at four, 2 negative 1 squared, so that's going to be 2 times 2, which is 4, and 4 minus 4 is 0, so that's going to be 0 squared which is obviously 0. So I have negative 2 times negative 5, which is 10, minus 0, which is 10, which means the discriminant is positive. Now, what's my conclusion? Well, if the discriminant is positive, I have to look at the partial with respect to x twice in either case to see if that is positive or negative. Then I have my conclusion. So my, you know, just look at the first piece right here. Just look at the first part of there. So here it was negative, right? It was negative in this case. So since my discriminant was positive and the partial of f with respect to x twice was negative two, which means that's negative, right? So what's my conclusion? Positive discriminant, negative. So positive discriminant, negative first partial with respect to x. So it means it's a local maximum, right? At 2, negative 1. Okay. And then the last one, 2, 4. So, all right, 2, 4, that's going to be 8 times 2 times 4 is 8, 8 minus 3 is 5, minus this at 2, 4, so that's going to be 2 times 2 minus 4, which is 4 minus 4, that's 0, so that gives me 40, that makes the discriminant positive. And the second order partial with respect to here is 8, which means that's positive. So if I have a positive discriminant and positive first order derivative, that means I have a local min. At 2, 4. Ta-da! So yeah, a lot of work to this problem. But, you know... That's how you find local extrema um, and classify them using the second derivative test for multivariate functions. Um, I do want to look at one more particular kind of case in this problem, or in this section, um, when we're dealing with um, sometimes we want to find, you know, the maximum or minimum of a function on a particular region or in a particular area of a curve or a particular region. So we're going to look at that next. So this is page four.
So we have a definition here. So suppose our function is continuous on a closed and bounded region. What do I mean by that? I just mean the region, you know, has a border around it. It could be like a triangle, a circle, a square, whatever. And it's bounded, meaning there's no cuts or gaps in the region. So, if f of x, y has a absolute max or absolute min. So in this case I'm using absolute. Because if you remember from Calc 1, why oh, did that not? There we go. If you remember from Calc 1, an absolute max or min occurs on a closed interval. And since I'm going to be dealing with a closed or bounded region, I'm going to have an absolute max or min. The only time a local maximum occurs is if you have an open interval on the whole domain. But we have closed domain here, so we're going to have an absolute. So if f of x has an absolute max or min on the region r, then these may occur only at a critical point of f of x, y in the region R or on the boundary of the region R. So that might seem it might seem a little obtuse, but basically all I'm saying here is if you have a closed region, the critical value is going to occur somewhere inside the closed region or on the border of it. Just like in Calc 1, if you had a function on a closed interval, the absolute max or min is going to occur somewhere inside the interval or at the endpoints of the interval. Same idea, just in an extra dimension. Um, so let's look at this example. So find the absolute, I cannot spell, um, extrema of f of x comma y equals x squared plus y squared minus 4xy on the region bounded by y equals x, y equals negative 3, and x equals 3. All right. So before we do anything, we want to sketch this region. So whip out your credit card and draw a coordinate system. I forgot my rulers at school. Go figure. Um, I guess I could order another one, but I'm not paying my own money for a ruler. Screw that. Um, Alright, so this region can occur on these lines, right? So the line y equals x, that's an easy line. You know what that is. That just goes through the origin as a positive slope. So here's the line y equals x. Right. Um, the line y equals negative 3, well that's just a horizontal line of negative 3. And the line x equals 3, so that's a vertical line at 3. Right. So so 
So if I go one, two, three, so that's a vertical line. So x equals three. Okay. So the region I have is right in here. That's the closed bounded region that I'm dealing with here. It's a triangle. Well, it's a right triangle actually. But that's the region I have. So I want to find the absolute extrema of this function on this enclosed region. All right, so I'm basically doing the same problem, but now instead of doing it on an open domain, I'm doing it on a closed region. So, all right, let's find the critical values. So the critical points All right, so what's the partial of f with respect to x and respect to y? So that's in my main function here. So this with respect to x is going to be 2x minus 4y. And then it's going to be, what, 2y minus 4x. All right? Okay, so I want to solve those equations. All right, well, so how do I solve that system? Well, that's an easy system. That's a linear system. Um, but, you know, you can do the uh, elimination or substitution method here. This is a you know, two by two system. That's easy to do. Um, so, you know, if you go through, this is a very easy system, but if you multiplied the first equation by, let's say, if you multiply the first equation by 2, all right, that's supposed to be a 2, doesn't look like a 2. <laughs> It's supposed to be a 2 in parentheses, but it's not. There we go. Um, this is running out of ink. Um, <clears throat> so if I multiply that by 2, I get 4x minus 8y equals 0. Then I have 2y minus 4x equals 0. And if I add them together, so the x's are going to cancel, right? So I have negative 8y plus 2y, which is negative 6y, which equals 0, which means y equals 0. Okay, well, so if I take that and I plug it into either one of these equations, if I take y equals 0 and plug it in there, then that means this is going to be, and that's going to make x equal to 0, or that's going to be the case, and that's going to make x equal to 0 there. So if I take that and plug in either one, I'm going to get, and if I plug it into this one, it doesn't matter, but if I take that and plug it in here, I'm going to get negative 4x equals 0, which means x equals 0. So I don't get any cases here. I just get one particular ordered pair, 0, comma 0. Um, so that is the only critical point that I get. Um, now remember what I said up here, the critical point could occur inside the region or on the boundary of the region. This is the region, right? Is this critical point inside the region or on the region? Yes, it is. It's right here. There's the point zero, zero. It's right there. So this critical point is on the region, so I do have to consider it. If it weren't on the region, I don't care about it. It's outside my domain, I don't care about it. Now, how do I know if it's an absolute max or absolute min? Well, you know, we'll worry about that later after we look at the borders of the region first, because that's the next thing we're going to look at. And then we're just going to look at what the highest and lowest values are, because that's what absolute means. They're either the highest or lowest. So now that we have the critical points, now we have to look at the region. All right, so now we have to look at the boundary. of R. So now we have to look at see any absolute maximums occur at this boundary, this boundary, or this boundary for this particular function. 
Okay. So the way you do this is you do it one curve or one line at a time. It doesn't matter which one you start with first. You just want to start with this one, this one. You have to do all three of them. So you got to pick one. And then you've got to do all three. Let's just pick one for now. I'll start with x equals 3. So when x equals 3, what does my function become when x is equal to 3? So plug it in. Let's see what we get. So that's the function f at 3, comma y now, right? So what do I get when I plug 3 in here for x? I'm going to get 9 plus y squared minus what? 12y. So I'm going to get 9 plus y squared minus 12y. So if I rewrite that a little bit, I'm going to get y squared minus 12y plus 9. So now, you know, since x is now constant, since I'm looking at this border of my region, right, this boundary, on this boundary, my function, my multivariate function becomes just a function of y. So this just becomes a function of y. So now I, what I want to do is I want to find the absolute max or min on this boundary. So I want to find the absolute max or min. I want to find critical values of this function of y. How do we do that? We do that the same way we did it in Calc 1. It's the exact same way. It's actually an easier case of this. Now it's just finding the maximum and minimum of this function, of this function on this curve, x equals 3. So since this is a function of y now, I'm just going to give it a uh, particular name. I'll, I'll call it g of y. Now, what's the value of these, um, you know, what's the value of this going to be? Well, so on this particular region, right, what are the bounds on this region? Well, I'm starting here and I'm going there, right? So if I start here when x is equal to 3, what's y there? y is negative 3. So the lowest value on this curve is going to be for negative 3. And what's the highest value y could be? Well, the highest it's going to go to is up here. That's when y equals x. So when does y equal to x at this point? Well, what is y? So at this point, we're saying x is equal to 3. So if x is equal to 3 here, then what's y equal to? y is equal to 3. So this point here is the order pair 3, 3. So that's the highest y can be. So basically, I'm just optimizing this function now on this domain. I'd, you know, on you have to look at this section here, right? You're looking at this part of my curve. At this point, we're saying x is 3. So here, y is negative 3. That's my lowest point of the, of the domain of this function for y. And the highest value for y is going to be at this point. Well, at this point, x is 3. And at this point is, well, x is y, then that means y is also 3. That means they're equal to each other. So that makes the highest value that could be, because you could see that's the highest value. It's the lowest, that's the highest on this line. So when, how do you maximize this? It's the exact, This just becomes a calc 1 problem. Take the first derivative of this, set it equal to 0, solve for y, and then find the absolute max and absolute min on this interval at the endpoints and any critical values. So let's do that. <clears throat> so if I take g prime of y, I get 2y minus 12, set that equal to 0, so I get 2y equals 12, and I get y equals 6. y equals 6, all right. Well, 
when x is equal to 3, right? So I said this right here is the ordered pair 3, 3, right? And this right here is the ordered pair 3, negative 3. That's the intersection between 3 and negative 3. Obviously, that's 3, 3. And this is the intersection of x equals 3 and y equals x. So they're the same point. So if x is equal to 3 and I get y equals 6, what ordered pair is that? That's the ordered pair 3 comma y. Or that's the ordered pair, I'm sorry, 3 comma 6. 3 comma 6 is up here somewhere. So do I care about it? I don't care about it. So this is not in the region. Let me scroll up here. So this is not, not in R. So since that's not in R, I don't care about it. I don't care about it. That's not my desired region. So I could omit that. And I'm only going to look at the maximum or minimum of this function at the endpoints, negative 3 and positive 3. So since I've already checked to see that there, this one is not an R, I don't have to worry about it. Don't worry about it. I don't care about it. Throw it away. So now just plug negative 3 into the original function. So when you do that, you get what? So when you plug negative 3 in here, you're going to get 54. And when you plug in positive 3 into here, you're going to get negative 18. Okay, so what this means is at this point, right, so at the point 3, negative 3, that's what this point is right here, right, 3, negative 3, I get a value of 54. So at 3, negative 3, that means this point that my function is 54. All right. Now at the point 3, 3, so when x is 3, y is 3, so that's here. So that means my function at 3, 3 equals what? Negative 18. All right. Okay. So that's just this curve. Now I have to do it again for this one and this one. You can see why these problems are a little lengthy, but... Um, yeah, I still got to do it. So let's, uh, let's do y equals negative 3 next. So when I do that, what does my function become? So that's f at x comma negative 3. So when you plug in negative 3 in here for y, so I'm going to get x squared. So negative 3 squared is... 9 and then minus 4xy so when x is so y is negative 3 so it's going to be minus 4 times negative 3 which is plus 12x which makes that a quadratic in terms of x so since this is a now this is a function of y or I'm sorry of x just like this one was a function of y so I'll give it a name I'll call it h of x And I'll rewrite it as a proper quadratic. Now, what's the um, what's the domain here? Well, so since I'm on this curve now, right? What's this point right here for x? So when y is negative three. Right, and I get to here. What's the intersection between y equals x and y equals negative three? That's going to be the ordered pair negative three for. That's going to be negative three comma negative three. Right. So the lowest x could be here is negative three, and the highest x could be here is well, positive three. It's the same thing. All right. So now. You essentially get almost the same problem here that we had here. Take the derivative, set it equal to zero. See if 
anything in between here and here is going to show up on my region. So h prime of x equals 2x plus 12. 2x equals negative 12. x equals negative 6. Is the ordered pair negative 6 comma negative 3 on this region? Nope. It's over here somewhere. This right here was negative 3, negative 3. All right. Negative 6, negative 3 is over here. It's not on my region, so I don't care about it. Just like in the first case. Not an R. So, the maxima or minima are going to occur at the endpoints. So, h at negative 3, so that's the original function at negative 3, is going to be negative 18. And h at 3, so when you plug 3 into there, so you're going to get 3 squared is 9, 36 plus 9, so 36 plus 18. is 54. So at the ordered pair 3, negative 3 is 54. We already did it. Hey, isn't that nice? See how it works out when you do it? So, you know, the only thing we really accomplished here was really looking at this one right here, right? So when we got here, so when y is negative 3, x is negative 3, so that's the order pair negative 3 and my function, so that's going to be negative 18, and that's what this is right here. Okay. Going crazy yet? We have one more case to look at. And that's when y equals x. So when y equals x, that means my function of x comma y is x comma x or y comma y. Either one is going to work out. So I'm going to make both of them x. So when you do that, you're going to get x squared plus x squared minus 4x squared. So x squared plus x squared minus 4x squared gives you, uh, that's going to be 2x squared minus 4x squared, which is negative 2x squared. Okay, well, what does that tell us? Well... What that means is that since I get a quadratic here, I get an actually a negative quadratic. So on this region, right, if I plug this in here and I get some value, I get negative 2x squared. Okay, well, this means I have a function in terms of x again. Now, you know, if I were to make this equal to a function in terms of x, right, and I were to take the derivative of this, right, so I just want to explain, if I, you know, if I let this equal, let's say I let it equal L of x, right, I give it another name, and then I take the derivative of L, set this equal to, so I'll have negative 4x equals 0, which means x equals 0. Well, if x equals 0 at this point, that means y is also going to be 0. So I'll just get the ordered pair 0, 0 again. But didn't I already get that up here? So what I end up getting here is, I'll just make a note here. Optimizing 
this case leads to the critical point zero zero. I already have it here. So what actually happens here is I don't care about this because it's just a duplication of this. You know, if I were to like make this equal to a function again, like just I'll just do it here for argument's sake. So let's say this was m of x equals negative 2x squared. I take the derivative, I get that. Set that equal to 0, I get x equals 0, right? If I did that here. If x is equal to 0 on this line, that means y equals 0. I get the order pair 0, 0, right? So, you know, you could do that here, but, you know, this just leads to extra work. So I don't have to consider this. All right. So to answer this question, what are my absolute max and absolute minimum of my original function on this boundary? Well, we already did it. So we kind of did it in the work here, and I kind of labeled it on my region. So when we did it in my work here, right? So when I optimized this region, I got these two points, right? And I got these two points here, which led to this one, which I labeled right here. And I labeled these two points, and this one I labeled right here. So that's on the region. This one gave me that one right there. And at this point, I got negative 18 there. So at this point, I got 54. At this point, I got negative 18. At this point, I got negative 18. Now, the only thing I haven't done is looked at the value of the critical point at f of x, y. Well, obviously, if you plug this into here, what do you get? You get 0. So my function at 0, 0 is also going to be 0. So, and, you know, how do we know there's no critical values inside the region or elsewhere on the border because we did the work for that down here this was not in this region this value for negative six and you know positive six they were not in the particular region so i didn't care about them and since they were the only cases that's the only ones that show up nothing's going to show up in here anyway because we already looked at the region so we looked at the critical value on the region there was only one critical point we found the values here, so 0, negative 18, negative 18, and 54. So the absolute maximum is going to be the largest value, and the absolute minimum is going to be the, mi the minimum value. So the answer I'll put right here, the absolute max, which one's the highest value? Well, it's going to be 54, right? So the absolute max is f at... 3 comma negative 3 which is 54 and what's the lowest value well I have 0 but I also have something lower I have negative 18 and negative 18 since they're a tie the absolute minimum occurs at two locations and for multivariate functions that can happen so the absolute minimum occurs at f at negative 3 3 and f at 3 3 and it equals negative 18. So that's how you do these problems. So the problem here is you find the critical points of the original function. And when you solve that system, you get this value here. You want to see if that occurs in a region, and it does. After that, you just consider the original function at each individual curve. You're going to get a single variable function. You're going to optimize that like you would in Calc 1. If it's not in the region, throw it away. Otherwise, you just look at the endpoints of the, of the curve and evaluate the function at those endpoints and hold on to them for later. And then once you exhaust all the curves, you're going to look at the highest value and lowest value of where it occurs on those particular curves, and that'll be your absolute max and absolute min. And that's how you do it. Um, I know this is a long process, so... You know, I'll give you some time to absorb that, but um, 
I'm going to look at one more section in this chapter before I go into double integration, and then we're going to look at, um, we get, yeah, we get into integration finally. Um, so, yeah, um, the last section in chapter 14 will be on Lagrange multipliers, um, <clears throat> which is an interesting subject, but it's relatively straightforward. It's a lot of busy work like this one, but even more so because there's a little bit more algebra that takes place, but it's not too bad. I'll do a few examples with that section and that'll be it for chapter 14. So that's the end of this video. Um, if you have any questions, don't be afraid to ask me guys. I know this is a lot and I know it's hard teaching it this way, but I'm doing the best I can with what I have. So if you're confused about anything, don't be afraid to ask me. Okay. That's the end of the video.